Thanks, Rob, and uh, thanks for having me today. It's great to be here. Um, uh, as with the previous speaker, if uh, if anyone does have any questions as we go through, please feel free to put them in the chat, and I will uh, attempt to uh, address them as we as we go through the session. Um, so, as Rob mentioned, we're really involved in mechanical testing of metal parts. So uh, a very top level overview. We are a mechanical testing company. We've developed novel mechanical testing methods based on indentation to predict tensile stress strain properties. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about um, the application of the technology to additively manufactured metal parts um, and also just a little bit about the work I'm doing as part of a UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship. So just a, a quick overview of uh, what we're talking about today. Uh, so I'll give you a brief introduction to Plastometrex for those of you who haven't heard about us before. Uh, I'll give you an introduction to our method, which is called profilometry based indentation plastometry. So you'll probably understand why we tend to abbreviate it to PIP testing. Uh, We'll talk about where the technique can add value in the additive manufacturing space and also look at a couple of case studies uh, before conclusions. So Plastometrex as a company was founded in 2018. So we're based in Cambridge uh, on the Science Park, which is particularly white today. Um, but although we founded the company only four years ago, it was really based on more than 10 years of research work uh, carried out by myself and others at the University of Cambridge. In 2020, we closed a seed investment round with Element Materials Technology. So Element are a global testing inspection and certification company, uh, and they did sort of validation testing, gave the product their stamp of approval, uh, and on the back of that invested in us. And that allowed us to launch our first commercial product, which I'll be uh, showing the case studies from today, um, which is the benchtop plastometer, which you can see in the image. So it's a, a benchtop device which will carry out the test uh, and then also the analysis. And as Rob mentioned, there is indeed one of these uh, up in Bolton at the centre. Um, early next year, we'll be launching our high temperature testing module. So testing up to 800 degrees C. Uh, and we're also going to be launching a portable testing device initially aimed at high value assets in the field. But of course, as AM parts become bigger, uh, there will be the potential for adding uh, a portable system onto some particularly large additively manufactured parts. So this is the, the benchtop machine, the current product that we have out on the market. So again, at a high level, it measures the strength of the materials in the form of stress strain curves, which we'll talk about using an indentation based technique. And some of the key value adds from that are that you can obtain a stress strain curve in under five minutes. Again, as we'll see, it allows you to map property variations, for example, across a build plate or a build volume. The test itself requires minimal sample preparation, so just a quick surface grind to make sure that you have a fairly flat uh, surface. And that also means we can test very small samples, so down to only um, three by three by one and a half millimeters thick. So really small sample uh, sizes are possible. So I'll introduce you first to the sort of scientific uh, basis behind the method. But before we do that, I did just want to touch on the basics of tensile testing. So because our method is designed to predict yield strength, and UTS, we're always judged against what you might call the gold standard for mechanical testing. So that is, of course, the tensile test. So uh, just showing a, a very schematic uh, image there of a of dog bone sample. So typically that would require machining. Uh, so using uh, CNC machining, whether that be on a lathe or a mill, even if you've printed it in near net shape, often uh, we prefer to machine the surfaces to reduce that surface roughness before we go uh, to testing. Um, and coupons will then be loaded in tension in a universal test machine, which I'm sure a lot of people will be familiar with. And we measure load and displacement during the test. Now, again, I'm sure this is familiar viewing to a lot of you. But this is a typical outcome of a, a um, tensile test. So we've got the elastic portion uh, where the stress and strain are approximately linear. And then we have the yield point where the material starts to deform plastically. We've then got uh, a portion where the stress and strain fields remain uniform uh, up to the point indicated there, the ultimate tensile strength, um, which occurs 
uh, at the sort of maximum uniform elongation point. And after that, the material will begin to neck down. So we'll see an, a sort of thinning of the sample in a particular region. Um, and then that will continue to neck until eventually the sample will fail. Um, and that is typically recorded then as a ductility value. So uh, again, calculation of nominal stress and nominal strain is very simple. Um, nominal stress simply force over the original cross-sectional area and strain the displacement um, in the, uh, the, the gauge region divided by the original length of the gauge region. So at the end, people would typically record yield stress, ultimate tensile strength, the elongation and reduction of area. So just wanted to recap a little bit about tensile testing before we go into PIP testing. So the method itself is conceptually at least fairly simple. So there are three key steps. The first is to create the indent. So we will first indent to a prescribed depth. Now to give you a sense of that, we'll typically indent to between 10 and 20% of the indenter radius. Now our standard indenter would be a one millimeter radius. And that means that we'll be indenting to between one and 200 microns deep. And the reason for that is we want to generate the strain in the material that we'd be interested in during a tensile test. So if we indented to only say 10 microns deep, we might only generate two or 3% strain in the material, but we're actually interested in strains in a tensile test of up to 30 or 40%. By the same token, if we indented all the way to the indenter, uh, the sort of equator of the indenter, we might generate strains of several hundred percent, which we're also not interested in during a tensile test. So it's a kind of compromise between those two extremes. So we'll indent to between one and 200 microns deep, and once we've done that, we then measure the residual profile shape. So um, we, on our machine, that is a stylus based profilometer. It will come in, it will measure the depth of the indent as well as the region around the outside, which is called the pileup region. And we'll see one of those scans in just a moment. In the background, there's a finite element method simulation of the exact same test that's been performed on the machine. And the only unknowns in that model are three parameters which define how the material deforms plastically. Uh, and again, we'll touch on the exact form of that equation in a moment. So from that model, we can output the predicted shape of the indent for a given set of properties. Uh, and what we then do in the optimization step is compare the shape that is predicted by the model with that from the experiment. And we iteratively update the parameters of the specimen until they match very, uh, sorry, iteratively update the parameters that define the plasticity in the specimen until the model experiment match very well. And at that point, we can then predict the properties. So just to look at each of those in, in a little more detail, um, the indentation, as we discussed, will be between 10 and 20 percent of the indenter radius. And this is an optical micrograph of one of those indents. So you can see here that because of the indenter size that we're using, that indent diameter is actually around a millimeter. And that's totally deliberate because what we need to ensure is that we capture all the microstructural features that lead to the bulk response that you're typically going to test during a tensile test. So that might be the effect of multiple grains, grain boundaries, precipitates, possibly second phases, all of the things that, that when you pull that bar are going to define actually what the properties are. If we were just in a single grain, for example, we wouldn't be capturing the effect of the grain boundaries, which are key to the bulk response. So that size of indent is totally deliberate. And then, as I said, once we've measured, uh, once we've created that indent, we'll then measure the profile shape. And one example is shown here. So this indent is about 180 microns deep, where it intersects with the Y axis. Uh, you can then see the spherical portion as we come out of that indent up into uh, the pileup region. So in this case, the pileup region is only about 10 microns high. Um, so you can see we've captured that full profile. And if you imagine rotating this by 360 degrees, as long as that uh, indent is radially symmetric, this uh, shape would define the full uh, extent of that indent. And we'll come back to radial symmetry uh, a little bit later. So in the most basic case, we assume radial symmetry of the indent, um, and then we move to the next step. So the model is also radially symmetric. So you can see an example there of the strain field generated under the indent. 
and we use uh, the equation shown to model the plasticity. So we've got a yield stress value and then two parameters that define how the material work hardens and they're linked by that exponential function. So that means that we get a yield stress and then some hardening behavior uh, captured by that equation. The only thing we do need as an input is the approximate Young's modulus of the material. So unlike a tensile test where you would you would measure that modulus, we do require that as an input to the test. Um, but just to set any uh, worries aside, the important thing there is we only need to know it fairly approximately. So if you have an aluminium alloy, its stiffness would be around 70 GPA. If you have, for example, a steel, it would be around 200. And if you measured that value previously to be 190 or 210, um, that would not be a big problem. The result would still be the same. So the, the Young's modulus is specified simply by saying uh, what is the base material. And once we run the optimization step, you can see there the best fit model. So that best fit model will correspond to a particular set uh, of plasticity properties. And you can see the agreement there with the indent depth uh, as well as the pileup region uh, is very good. We've done that simply by minimizing uh, a misfit parameter which compares the difference between uh, the model and the experiment. And then once we've completed that, as I say, we can then present the results. So we know for that best fit model, what parameters we had to input into the model to get them. Uh, so we'll have a yield stress and we'll have uh, the work hardening behavior as well. So just to address one of the questions here, so it's a question is, can this be used to indent thin films? 100 to 200 micrometer thick, polymer material so unfortunately the answer to that one is no um, we are totally focused on metals here at plastometrex at least at the moment uh, and all of the modeling that i've talked about the finite element analysis that goes in the background uh, is all based on the kind of fundamental uh, assumptions of metal plasticity so conservation of volume uh, we assume the material is not undergoing any kind of creep type or time dependent effects and so uh, that those two assumptions kind of invalidate that for any kind of polymer material material. Um, the other questions are uh, how many indenter types? So we just have one indenter type. We use a spherical indenter that has a couple of benefits. The first one being um, spherical ball bearings of the appropriate size and material are uh, cheap and widely available. So they can easily be swapped in and out of the machine. Uh, in addition, the uh, radial symmetry of a, a spherical indent means that the modeling uh, can happen very quickly. Uh, and then finally, what is the loading rate? So again, because we're talking about metals, we're really talking about quasi-static plasticity. Um, so we're assuming there is no effect from creep, so a time-dependent deformation, but also no strain rate effects from going very, very quickly. So we're typically comparable with you know, ASTM E8 tensile tests that are done at a strain rate of about 10 to the minus three. So please keep questions coming as we go through, more than happy to answer them. So now we've sort of seen the method, uh, I'm sure the question on, on everyone's lips is, well, does it work? Um, and we have done a huge amount of validation testing uh, here at Plastometrex with both internal tests, uh, external, such as with, with Rob, uh, as well as many other in industrial collaborators. Um, so we're showing here just some of that data on a unity plot showing uh, the PIP inferred value for yield stress on the y-axis uh, and tensile test measured values on the x-axis. And you can see for a huge range of uh, engineering materials, we're getting really good agreement between um, the indentation PIP test and the tensile test measured values. Um, so you can see right at the bottom, uh, close to the, the sort of zero, zero, there's an annealed copper that has a, a yield stress of around 50 megapascals, all the way up to sort of bearing type steels uh, that have yield stresses in the gigapascal range. The same is true for the ultimate tensile strength. So again, very strong agreement between um, the PIP inferred values and that from the tensile test measured. So where are the areas in which we see at least that this could be used to add value to AM testing? Well, this slide is probably defunct in this audience. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with, with what additive manufacture is, but I think the key points are that it does have several advantages over conventional processing. Um, you can print things fairly quickly, so you can design a part and then you can print it um, within 
possibly hours, allowing for rapid prototyping. And of course, the flexibility gives you uh, the possibility of innovating on your design, smaller production runs, reducing material waste. And of course, at the moment, everyone is suffering. Supply chain issues can be alleviated. And this is reflected in the data on the right hand side, just showing the uptake now of um, production AM parts. So for a disclaimer, this is for all AM parts, but the huge growth has been in the metallics. So in 2020 alone, there were more than five billion dollars of parts produced. Uh, and yeah, as I say, although some of those will be plastics, the high value parts do tend to be the metallic ones. So uh, it's certainly growing in terms of parts that are being produced. One of the issues is that, of course, tensile test data or testing remains the gold standard for obtaining metal stress strain curves. And there are several issues associated with that. It does require fairly large samples. So if you are going to do a tensile test, so, you know, by standard ASTM E8, you need to print a minimum of around 80 millimeters uh, of material in length. So if you're printing, for example, a Z bar, uh, that can take a reasonable amount of time. And if you want to characterize anisotropy, so where there might be different properties in, in different directions, that's going to require multiple bars. As we've touched on, that still requires machining. So you need uh, either machining facilities in-house or externally to then machine the specimen into the exact uh, geometry that you'd like or remove the surface roughness in the case you've printed near net shape. You do, of course, destroy the sample. So, you know, at the end of a tensile test, the sample will be in two pieces. Um, and that also means that mapping changes in properties over the build can be very difficult. So if you imagine you print a witness coupon and also your part just next to it, um, there is absolutely no certainty that the witness coupon will have the exact same properties as the part, given that they'll have both undergone slightly different uh, thermal histories. So being able to map properties is actually a big advantage. And of course, you can't tensile test an actual part that's going to go into the field uh, because it will be destroyed after that. So the UK AM National Strategy Report recommended there is a need to develop mechanical testing processes suitable for additive manufacturing to enable what they called fit for purpose evaluation. Uh, and it won't surprise you to know that we think at least, and we're probably biased, that PIP testing fulfills uh, all of those requirements. So what are the more sort of uh, tangible benefits? Well, we surveyed more than 450 manufacturing and research organizations here at Plastometrex and found the following. So the average turnaround time for a tensile test is five working days, so up to 40 working hours. And just to put that into perspective, if you um, if you were doing, a, for example, uh, iteratively improving your print parameters to try and maximize maybe yield stress or ultimate tensile strength, that means you'd have to wait five days to actually get the data from the build that took you maybe just a few hours to then iterate to the next step. 25% of the organizations had to wait between two and eight weeks to get their data, so up to 320 working hours for their results. And as you can see in the plot on the right hand side, PIP can reduce both the cost per test, but also the time to result, which is potentially even more important, as well as providing those insights such as mapping properties, which are very difficult to obtain with conventional means. So just a couple of case studies um, specific to AM that I wanted to talk about today. So the first one was a case study with Oxford University, um, and we looked at assessing whether PIP testing could substitute tensile testing for accurate measurement of stress strain properties of small super alloy components. Um, and then we had a secondary objective to determine whether the degree of anisotropy in some printed materials could be determined. So this was the material that we were looking at. So it's a nickel based uh, super alloy. So it's actually ABD 850 for those of you familiar with the work that's being done at Alloyd um, and it's made by laser powder bed fusion. So we can see in the EBSD uh, plots on the right hand side, the XY plane is approximately equiaxed in terms of uh, the grain structure and there was no strong texture uh, from that particular plane. So the XY plane being uh, the, you know, the standard sort of parallel to the, the base plate of uh, the printer. And then the XZ plane where Z is the build direction, we can see strongly directional growth. So 
we've got uh, a 100 type texture uh, preferentially oriented along the build direction as well as uh, large columnar grains in that direction as well so this material is clearly uh, at least on a microstructural level strongly textured so how does that manifest itself during conventional tensile testing so there's two ways uh, that, that we see this so in the insert you can see um, that there's a small difference in the elastic modulus uh, when tested in the horizontal and vertical directions um, now this can be explained by that strong texture and the, the uh, elastic constants of a single crystal uh, which say that the the vertical direction in this case of so the 100 direction will have a, a slightly lower stiffness than uh, than the others and that's a, a small difference that's picked up during tensile. But th the other key feature is we get very different properties in terms of yield stress uh, and ultimate tensile strength in those different directions. So we can see here the horizontal direction is more than 10% harder uh, than the vertical direction. So we've got strong crystallographic texture on the microstructural level manifesting itself as strong anisotropy um, on the sort of macroscopic testing level. So what about PIP testing on this material? So you can see here that we've actually done indents in two planes. Um, we've got the XY plane where we've just got a single plot. And that's because in that plane, that indent showed perfect radial symmetry. So never mind uh, which direction you look at, the scan always looks exactly the same. However, in the X and Z plane, we start to see a difference. So as I, as I said, we're using a spherical indenter and what we'll always do is check uh, two orthogonal directions to see if those, uh, those scans are the same. So what we can see on that image on the bottom left is the depth of the indent is the same. Uh, that is because it is a single indent. So whether we scan it in any direction, the depth should always be the same. But in the pileup region now, you can see that the vertical direction has a higher pileup height than the horizontal. Now, what that immediately tells us is the horizontal direction is fairly significantly harder than the vertical direction. Um, and we just need to keep that in mind as we go into the analysis. So because of the way the modeling is set up at the moment, so it's all radially symmetric, we can't process those two different scans from the same indent uh, in our typical software package, but we can process the, what, the data from the XY plane because that indent did show uh, radial symmetry. So we can go ahead and do that. And the result looks like this. So what can we take away from this? Well, it's clear that the PIP inferred values lie pretty much exactly between um, those from the horizontal and vertical directions. That's from the indent in the XY plane. And you might say, well, is that what we expect? And the important thing to note is that unlike uniaxial tensile testing, as an indentation testing technique, we're always going to have an influence of almost every direction that we're indenting in. So whether that be sort of along the indentation axis or the radial direction, what we really expect would be a multi-directional response or a direction average response, if you like. And that is pretty much what we see in this case. So an average of the two extremes in terms of that anisotropy. If we combine that with the fact we saw in that indent in the X, Z direction, we saw that the horizontal direction had a lower pileup height and therefore was harder than the, the vertical direction. Um, we can start to build up that 3D picture of how this material is deforming. So that isn't, doesn't mean to say that there aren't lots of applications for uh, PIP testing in AM already, but we can't quantify anisotropy at this point. That is a project that I'm working on as part of um, the Future Leaders Fellowship to develop the techniques to be able to quantify the difference in the different orientations. So that is sort of under software development at the moment. And anyone, I guess while we're here for, for this event, anyone who'd like to collaborate on, on that kind of work, if you have anisotropic uh, metal 3D printed parts, then I would be all ears. It'd be great to talk to you. So case study number two is potentially a slightly more simple case uh, where 
we started out trying to assess whether PIP could substitute tensile for uh, accurate measurement of stress strain curves on some mar aging steel components. And as you'll see, it quickly became an investigation as to why the properties were varying uh, in different locations on the part. So this is the, the tensile test data that had been supplied to us. So this was a, uh, a say, mar aging steel printed on an EOS machine, and it supposedly showed fairly strong differences between the horizontal and vertical specimens. So you can see here, the horizontal is more than 10% um, harder than the vertical direction. And the important thing here was we were looking to investigate anisotropy in the material and how we could capture that using PIP testing. The anisotropy persisted in the heat treated condition. So this is now been heat treated at six hours uh, around 500 C. And we can see you know, typical mar aging steel behavior has got significantly harder, um, but we can still see the horizontal is still slightly harder than the vertical direction. So when we receive the samples, the first thing to do is carry out an indent. And you can see here that what we've done in this case is scanned that single indent in four different directions. So we've got the X direction, the Y direction, the Z direction. So this was on the XZ plane, but also the 45 and 135 uh, in between. And unlike the material uh, that we saw in the previous case study, you can now see that there is almost no difference in those pileup heights. Uh, there's, a, there's a very, very small difference, sub a micron um, in the 135 degree direction but the material really does show no strong anisotropy and certainly um, not as much as we were expecting given those tensile uh, stress strain curves that we saw initially. So we then decided the best course of action would be to indent the part in different locations uh, and determine if there was any inhomogeneity in the structure. And this is what we found. So when we did uh, indents, at around five millimeters from the build plate. You could see there the prediction of PIP lines up very well with the horizontal tensile. So the horizontal tensile was built close to the build plate. We did an indent also close to the build plate and we can see that we get really quite good agreement there. We then did an indent at around 100 millimeters high at the top of one of the specimens and we could see this marked change in the properties so a reduction in the in the yield stress but also a reduction in the work hardening rate and that then matched up very well with the tensile vertical so what was actually happening in the tensile test was quite simply the material uh, as, as that z tensile had been built up the material was getting softer and softer so when you then pull on that tensile bar it effectively just yields in the softest part of the bar and that sort of manifests itself if you like as a, a lower yield stress but actually what we've done is we've just seen where is the softest point in that bar so one of the advantages there of pip testing is not only does it give you those insights incredibly difficult to, to get uh, by tensile testing but in addition you can then start to for example uh, use that information in your in your design calculations to say we know that actually closer to the build plate because of the the thermal history of the part we've actually got quite slightly harder properties um, and then as we go up the build direction we know that it's going to get softer and then you've got that information to then build into your uh, design for your final part the same was true in the heat treated case so again you can see um, the the two tensile tests and then the pip test carried out close to the build plate and then a significant so 60 millimeters away from the build plate again we're picking up those differences between the two locations with the, the vertical or as you go higher up the build um, the material just becoming softer so instead of it actually being the material being strongly anisotropic um, as indicated by the tensile results, we've actually shown quite convincingly that it's just inhomogeneous. So to conclude, um, we've seen that PIP has several advantages over conventional testing, uh, and I would argue it does make it the perfect complement for additively manufactured metals. So the, the testing being very quick, being able to map properties, I think really fits in with some of the issues that are faced by the additive community. Um, PIP testing can accurately captured plasticity response uh, of metallic materials 
and also we've seen how we can also give qualitative information about anisotropy and we've seen that example there at the end where we've mapped the properties and provided insights that conventional testing simply can't do so hopefully we are now back on time rob uh, and i'm more than happy to take a few questions if there are any we're well back on time <laughs> thank you jimmy I've got a, a question, something that I, I know I've asked you before, but I think it's quite interesting for, for additive uh, and maybe it's worth covering. Effective porosity it doesn't seem to have a huge impact on a on an indent test, um, which is quite an interesting thing for initial parameter development where you're looking for bulk performance regardless for no optimization of porosity. Can you just comment briefly on, on that side from, from your experience? Yeah, I guess um, in terms of the, the additive world, porosity tends to depend on who you're speaking to. So if we start in the laser powder bed sort of um, region, then we'll, we'll move to binder jet. So our typical uh, line is that if the porosity is, is less than 1%, um, then you should be absolutely fine carrying out a pit test. So uh, in a lot of sort of, uh, initially people will optimize for porosity, so you want to get your laser powder bed parameters such that porosity is say sub 0.5% and then you can start doing, you know, optimize those uh, parameters for mechanical strength. So if you get to sub 0.5%, um, th there's no reason you can go ahead and then do a full parameter sweep uh, to maximize mechanical properties. Now, in the binder jet space where you might be expecting porosity of more like a minimum say of one percent we do start to see some differences so if we if you think about what porosity might do to your mechanical response so in a tensile test um, if you effectively remove material by including porosity in the structure then you're going to reduce the yield stress you know, very approximately by the amount of porosity that is present. So if you include 1% porosity, you might expect the yield stress to drop by say 1%. Um, but you also expect the ductility um, of the material to come down quite significantly. So you might uh, you might think that uh, the porosity would have not much effect, but actually what you will often see is that those pores might act as a initiation site for a fracture type event. So in a tensile test, you pull it and you might get some of that porosity acting as a, a fracture generation site and then it will break. Um, and that is a mode one type fracture event. In PIP testing, you will actually see those pores be compressed. So um, we won't see any fracture type response from the indentation. Now, as long as the material reaches um, its necking point, that will not affect our prediction of the UTS. It will still be accurate, but one thing is, as you alluded to, Rob, as long as that porosity is less than 1%, it doesn't have a strong effect on the profile that we we pick up. And that means that, you know, as long as we aren't getting into sort of more extreme values of porosity, if you like, um, we can still accurately predict the properties. So in the case where you have something that's incredibly brittle uh, and will just, for example, snap in the elastic region of a tensile test, we can still give you actionable properties, yield stress and hardening behavior, which you might not be able to get just by pulling on a tensile bar. That was quite a long answer to your question, Rob, so I hope it was No, no, no it's, <laughs> it's good to hear, it's good to hear, thank you. Anybody else with any questions for Jimmy? So I think there is one question there. Can we provide different types of hardening related to different metal AM materials? Uh, I think I think really the question is there, can we pick up the different types of hardening you might get in different types of material? And I think the, the, the short answer to that would be yes. Um, that pile-up height really gives us a lot of information about how the material, uh, how much force does a Mario aging steel can we stand without fracture? Um, the, yeah, so the pile-up height will give us a lot of information about how the hardening takes place. And therefore, if we have a low uh, pilot pipe, we know there's going to be a lot of hardening from yield up to UTS. A high pilot pipe means that there's going to be very low um, sort of rate of hardening. So that's one of the key things that we pick up um, and that effectively gives us the UTS value uh, or at least the difference between yield and UTS. Um, and then Sanjay says, how much force does a Mar aging steel can withstand without fracture? Um, 
That is a good question. Uh, it's kind of mixed up, I guess, with with a little bit of what we talked about in terms of the, the fracture event. The, the maximum stress that the Mar Aging Steel could withstand in a tensile would be the UTS in this case. Um, and if we just flick back to those, once it's heat treated, you can see that the, the maximum um, the UTS predicted by both PIP and measured by tensile is in the region of two gigapascals. So um, you know, that's fairly consistent with what you can get with with just conventionally processed mar aging steel as well. I've got an, another brief one. Or oh, somebody else has asked other people more important. So is there ability to capture material properties in different regions? So yes, so uh, sorry, Alistair, if you didn't sort of catch the full case study at the end there. Um, that's absolutely one of the, the key sort of attributes is within just 10 minutes or so, you could do an indent on, uh, as we did in this case, one end of the tensile bar, which might be very close to the build plate, and then the other end of that tensile bar, which in this case was around 100 millimeters from the build plate, and we saw you know, quite different properties in those different regions. So varying UTS by up to around 10%. So I guess one of the key value adds, it really is that you can do that, that mapping capability. We've we've started doing that. I'll present the results shortly, but we've started doing that on some wire arc parts where we're looking for effect of wall thickness on mechanical performance and um, very, very early. We've had some issues with getting parts back from wire EDM, but we, we're certainly starting to look at that because uh, yeah, there's a, there's an effect in Z, but wall wall thickness will also have an effect too. So lots yeah. of opportunities to build on that. I think anywhere where you see, you know, during the processing, anywhere where you see different cooling rates effectively, um, you know, that that could lead to different properties, and that is an opportunity, I guess, to to check those properties using this kind of testing. Um, We've got another question. Question on lattice structures. Yeah, what if what if there is only lattice structure? Would we still be able to do the test? Uh, that, that is a good question. Uh, I think for your conventional lattice structures, you know, that you um, would be talking about with with additive, the answer is probably not. So as I said at the start, our minimum sample dimensions at the moment are three millimeters diameter and one and a half millimeters thick, which would probably be an exceptionally thick uh, lattice structure. Um, there is no reason theoretically that you couldn't go down to much smaller uh, indent sizes. The key is you still have to satisfy those requirements to uh, indent a large number of grains. So there is that kind of fundamental uh, limitation of if the grain size is too big um, or if you want to make a very small indent, then um, you're going to go down to you know, the lattice structure. I suspect that you are asking about will probably be too small uh, for us to indent. And I'm building on on that, if if you had a lattice structure with a um, with an outer wall, as which met all your expectations, you you would be able to do a test. And I guess that you'd have to bear in mind that there could be an increase in scatter because of any flexibility in the lattice, rather than it being 100% stiff as as bulk material would expect to be. So it could be a nice way of proving whether your lattice is working as you'd like, but you still have to have the skin thickness as you'd you know, to meet those requirements of one and a half mil or so thick. Yeah, I guess it kind of raises a, a similar point though, is in terms of if you want to test a part that's uh, coming off a final you know, production component, I think in that case, you need a kind of design for PIP testing where you know you can, like you kind of alluded to Rob, you can print the material in such a way that there's a part you can remove and then test uh, ex situ later on. Um, and if you, for example, put those at different heights on your component, that would allow you to, to check the properties uh, as a function of position across the whole component. What about the, um, you, you mentioned the, the almost non-destructive indent that, that doesn't give you everything you need for your simulation. Is there a potential opportunity to build the data in that field so that you could have some form of correlation between a, a standard pip of a, a no of a known material and then you do some smaller indents to build up a almost non-destructive variant so you could then multi-map a part or a section without actually causing destructive testing which is almost easily removable rather than a nearly 200 micron indent yeah so uh, as 
Okay, there's several layers <laughs> to answer the question. So um, we do provide with the machine a standard one smaller indenter. So that means your indenter would be a half a millimeter radius and your indent depth would be 50 to 100 microns deep. That kind of depth is quickly removed just by, uh, you know, some some standard post processing. Um, in terms of being able to sort of correlate even smaller indents with, you know, the results you might get on a bigger part, we sort of stray into the area where you can correlate standard hardness testing with tensile test results uh, and that's an area we're not uh, if not very keen on i would say here at plastometrics we, we are so sort of pure finite element driven uh, analysis um none of the results you've seen today involve any sort of correlation factors they are simply you put the material under the machine and you click go um so in terms of doing that sort of correlative exercise it's something that i would try and avoid if, if at all possible Good. Question again on films, I think you kind of answered that there. If you use a, the smaller bear when you've got a film up to 200 microns, you would be able to measure the performance of the film only. Um, and what with the usage of PIP in how many days can we expect the data of tensile testing? So uh, just again, Sandra, to answer that question, um, the, the test itself takes less than five minutes um, to actually perform. Um, the preparation is really very straightforward. So we typically would just mount the specimen and then a couple of surface grinding steps. Um, so we recommend grinding to a minimum of P1200. So that would be maybe three grinding papers. So, you know, if you, uh, if you know your way around a, a metallography lab, you probably have the results from starting component to final result in 25 to 30 minutes, I would say. Good. Perfect. Feel free to carry on the, the question into to Jimmy's email address, which you posted in the chat or, or in the chat. Um, thanks for your time and insight, Jimmy. We'll, uh, we'll move on if that's okay. Yeah, thanks, Rob.